This episode was brought to you by Skillshare. Get two months of Skillshare for free and learn new skills by using the link in the description. The person known as D.B. Cooper may have pulled off one of the greatest feats of criminality known to man, not just because of the crime, but more the subsequent literal vanishing into thin air. Some criminals go down in history as almost heroic. They become the stuff of folklore. We have noble highwaymen. We have people that robbed the rich only to share their spoils with the poor. We have bank robbers such as John Dillinger, who became a legend after stealing from the big bad banks and being very kind with the swag. Then we have outlaws such as Jesse James, whose legend appears to be somewhat overblown in both books and movies. But in today's show, we'll focus on the man whose actions were certainly not fiction. Welcome to this episode of the Infographics Show. Who was D.B. Cooper? Before we start sleuthing, we must know what it is this man did. We should also tell you that the name D.B. Cooper was a given name by the media. Who he really is is still up for speculation. We'll get around to the theories later. Twas the night before Thanksgiving, November 24, 1971, when through the doors of the busy Portland International Airport, a man went up to the check-in counter for Northwest Orient Airlines. Throughout the USA, people were traveling back home or already drinking the festive hooch. Turkeys were thawing, corn pudding had been made in the morning. The man checked in under the name Dan Cooper. He was to take a half-hour flight to Seattle, a short trip home, presumably, to spend time with loved ones. That was far from the case. He was about to create criminal history. He walked onto a Boeing 727-100. Some people say he sat in seat 18C, but others dispute that. Whatever the seat, it seems our Mr. Cooper was in the mood for merriment. He sat back, lit up a smoke, and imbibed in a bourbon and soda. According to witnesses who were later interviewed, he wore a dark suit and a black tie, decorated with a mother-of-pearl tie pen. From the sketches you could say, he looked not unlike Don Draper from the series Mad Men. And a madman the man known as Dan Cooper certainly was. He was later described by flight attendants to be 5 foot 10 inches to 5 feet 11 inches tall, 170 to 180 pounds. It's said that he has tanned skin and was likely in his 40s. Not long into the flight, this smartly dressed man handed a note to a flight attendant. Her name was Florence Schaffner, and she was probably used to single guys handing her phone numbers, so she just put the note in her purse. According to New York Mag, this 23-year-old cute, perky, and sexy stewardess was not unaccustomed to guys hitting on her. This time was different. Cooper then leaned over to her and said, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. She looked at him and knew he wasn't fooling around. The note read, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I want you to sit beside me. She did just that, and the man showed he wasn't kidding, offering her a glimpse of some sticks of dynamite and lots of wires attached to a battery. He then apparently told her, I want $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash, put in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. $200,000 in today's money is about $1.2 million. He wasn't too greedy, it seems. According to Schaffner, she was reeling with fear. Was the plane about to explode? Were a lot of people about to get grilled in midair before the turkey was even roasted? She was confused, too. This smartly dressed guy had been polite. He'd even given her a $20 bill for the whiskey and told her she could keep the 18 bucks change. He wasn't a political terrorist, one of the sky pirates she'd heard about. Another flight attendant later remarked, he wasn't nervous, he seemed rather nice. He was never cruel or nasty. He was thoughtful and calm all the time. She went to the cockpit and told the news to the crew, after which the pilot informed the Seattle-Tacoma Airport air traffic control, and the authorities were alerted. The plane circled in the air for around two hours with the passengers not knowing what was going on. They were told the plane was experiencing a minor mechanical difficulty. What was really happening is that the authorities had decided to meet the hijacker's demands, and they were putting together a list of things, including the money he had asked for. The man stayed calm and even started talking about what he could see down below meaning he obviously knew the area well. He ordered another bourbon and again told Schaffner she could keep the change. Down below, the money was being put together in unmarked bills, although it said Cooper wasn't happy with the military-issue parachutes. He wanted civilian parachutes, and they had to be taken from a nearby skydiving school. The aircraft landed at 5.39 p.m. at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. Cooper told the pilot to taxi to a brightly lit area of the airport and wait for all the window shades to be lowered, lest a sniper try and take him out. Northwest Orient Seattle Operations Manager Al Lee delivered the cash and the parachutes to the aircraft. Cooper then told the passengers they could go, as could two of the flight attendants, including Schaffner. One remained. 
He then told the cockpit crew that they would all be going on a trip to Mexico City, except he wanted them to fly at the lowest speed possible. He also told them to fly at 10,000 foot altitude. The pilots told them that they would need to refuel once more and Nevada was chosen. Cooper told them to keep the landing gear down and for the cabin to remain unpressurized. He told authorities that no one could come on board during the refueling while they were in Seattle. And off they went into the skies, bounty in the bag flying at a snail's pace for the plane. They weren't alone up there, with five military planes following them. It's said the last person to see Cooper was a 22-year-old flight attendant called Tina Mucklow. She said he told her to go back to the cockpit, and the last thing she witnessed was him tying something around his waist. It's said later she never talked much about the evening, and later in life became reclusive and partly lived in a nunnery. With the crew all in the cockpit, they heard an alarm indicating that the aft air stair apparatus had been deployed. Apparently, the pilot sent a warning that this was very dangerous. It was around 8 p.m., just over two hours after the aircraft landed, and the mysterious bourbon quaffing hijacker was not one of the occupants of the plane. Here's a little song about what likely happened sometime after 8. Out on a little service doorway in the rear of the plane, Cooper jumped into the darkness into the freezing rain. They say that with the wind chill, it was 69 below. Not much chance that he'd survive, but if he did, where did he go? Indeed, where did he go? The feds looked all over for him, for the parachutes, for anything. They went through every bit of forest where he might have landed. A submarine scoured lakes, but the man had vanished. It was the largest search ever by law enforcement, and in the end, all they found were the remains of a girl that had been abducted and murdered. For years, the police searched for the money, as all the bills had serial numbers, but they never showed up either, except when a couple of swindlers tried to get a $30,000 reward from Newsweek by counterfeiting the bills with the serial numbers. The press had a field day, and it was a mistake made by a reporter which gave him the name D.B. Cooper. It stuck. As for the American people, most folks loved the story of the handsome, well-spoken, James Bond-like character. People rooted for him, likely to the chagrin of law enforcement. He was like a noble highwayman of modern times a Robin Hood of the skies. What the cops did know is that this guy knew how to parachute. He knew planes. He knew the area. How hard could it be to put the pieces together? Very hard is the answer. The FBI had lots of leads that came in to nothing, changing their story a few times. For instance, the FBI later said that he was likely not someone who knew a lot about parachuting. We concluded after a few years that this was simply not true, they said. No experienced parachutist would have jumped in the pitch black night in the rain with a 200 mile an hour wind in his face, wearing loafers and a trench coat. It was simply too risky. It was concluded by some that the man had simply died and the authorities had failed to find the body. He even had copycats, such as Richard McCoy, a former Vietnam helicopter pilot who tried to do the same. He was arrested in a matter of days and he swore that he was not Cooper, just a guy trying his luck. But was it him? While he was serving a 45-year sentence, he had made a courageous and cunning prison escape, only later to be killed in a shootout with cops. The agent that killed him said this, When I shot Richard McCoy, I shot D.B. Cooper at the same time. However, that doesn't quite work as McCoy's family told police while Cooper's air heist was going on. McCoy was with them having a party for Thanksgiving Eve. Then, in 1980, an eight-year-old boy on holiday made a discovery when he was on the riverbank of the Columbia River. The boy pulled $5,800 from the bank, all in $20 Federal Reserve notes. This was part of the ransom. Many theories were put forward as to how the bills ended up there. Did they float there? Were they buried there? No one really knew. Some people thought it was Ted Mayfield, a skydiving teacher with a history of criminality including stealing a plane and armed robbery. Mayfield even called the FBI four hours after the heist to give them a list of skydivers who might have done it. But there's no cognate evidence to say Mayfield was D.B. Cooper. What about Kenneth Christensen? He was a spitting image for the sketch of Cooper. He was a former paratrooper and he'd even spent time working as a flight attendant on Northwest Orient. He was usually broke, but then in 1972 suddenly had bags of cash and bought a house. It gets better. On his deathbed in 1994, he told his brother, there's something you should know, but I cannot tell you. The brother then discovered that in his bank he had around $200,000 and he had also been left gold. Meanwhile, flight attendant Schaffner said he was a dead ringer for Cooper. The brother wrote in 2004, close to death himself, Before I die, I would like to find out if my brother was D.B. Cooper. From what I know, I feel that he was and without a doubt. We very much doubt it was Barbara Dayton. 
a trans woman who had once said she did it to get back at the airline for not being able to get a commercial pilot's license. She changed her tune anyway when she found out she might actually be charged for the hijacking. What about William Gossett, an ace parachutist who had survival training? According to an attorney called Galen Cook, Gossett had admitted he had done it. Gossett's son believes his dad did it, saying he got very rich in 1971 and then went on a gambling spree in Las Vegas. Still, the evidence is weak. Then there's Robert Richard Lepsey, whose car was found nearby the airport and who suddenly decided to take off to Mexico. When his daughter saw the sketch of Cooper, apparently she shouted, that's dad! She gave the FBI a DNA sample some years later, but it seems they didn't think Lepsey was their man. Still, we might wonder if he's sipping on pina coladas right now basking on an Acapulco beach at the expense of an American insurance company. Or could it have been Dwayne Weber, who told his wife just before he died, I'm Dan Cooper. He was seen near to where the kid had found the money, and he also looked like Cooper. Again, the DNA wasn't a match, but it was also inconclusive as it was with others. They got the DNA, by the way, from Cooper's tie, which he kindly left behind before he leaped. Jack Caulfield also claimed he was Cooper, to a cellmate no less. He apparently suffered broken legs around the same time of the hijacking and was also in the right place. Despite his cellmate swearing it was him and trying to make a few bucks from TV and movies, no one really thinks it was Caulfield. It was just as unlikely to be L.D. Cooper, a war veteran whose niece believed he had done it. Again, there's some interesting implications, but nothing solid. Former pilot and war veteran Robert Rackstraw had all the skills to pull off such a job, and his face looked the part. Rackstraw denied it. His attorney said it was ridiculous, but many believe it was him, and the FBI wouldn't release Cooper's case file under the Freedom of Information Act because they were embarrassed some amateurs had uncovered the case. War veteran Walter R. Recca also said he was D.B. Cooper. Before he died in 2014, he gave details to his friend about the crime that had not been heard before. A fraud examiner and forensic linguist examined the evidence the friend had and it seemed it all pointed to the fact that Rekka could have been D.B. Cooper. Is this the most likely candidate? The Washington Post in 2018 wrote about this, saying, When the friend may have had compelling evidence in regard to how the crime took place and the details the friend knew, the FBI would not reopen the case if the money or parachutes were not given to them. And so, D.B. Cooper could have been one of those people, or someone else. He could have died in the fall. Or there could be a totally different story behind what happened after that eventful flight on Thanksgiving Eve. We love that you enjoy our videos, but maybe you'd like to learn how to make your own. No worries, Skillshare has your back with over 24,000 online classes for both the beginner and the pro. Why not check out the basics of animation? or learn how to light and shoot subjects with one of Skillshare's many online classes in film and digital photography. Skillshare is a perfect place to learn new skills or improve on your existing ones. The first thousand people to sign up by visiting Skillshare.com slash infographics35 or by clicking the link in the description will receive two months of Skillshare absolutely free. Join Skillshare and start learning today. Now we'll turn this over to you and ask you who you think D.B. Cooper was. Tell us in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other videos. This is how Warren Buffett made $85 billion. Thanks for watching, and as always, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.